and lay down the time. Uh, right. yeah. We used to have it that they have to repeat the question in front because they couldn't hear any right. questions from the audience, but that's no longer. You're alive, so you can start whenever you're ready, sir. Well, welcome. Um, my name is Mark Smith, and um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, on my uh, a mark on art. Uh, and uh, it's like coming home, because uh, uh, I was an elder and a deacon at this church, and a, a member for, oh, I don't know, over 40 years or more. So, uh, and uh, so it's, it's nice coming home. And, um, which is also interesting, I came to this area um, 50 years ago. Um, uh, Hershey Park had opened up uh, a new area, and um, the Dutch plots, which they featured uh, crafts, and um, I did blacksmithing. And uh, uh, also what came uh, it, 50 years ago was Agnes. So um, 50 years later, I hope uh, uh, we're not flooded with something else. Uh, so uh, um, I was going <laughs> to. So where are we? Um, let's see. Um, I, you know, I asked a couple people, like, what should I? You know, what aspect of of uh, Smithing should I be talking about? And a lot of people um, said, "Well, why did you be? Why did you become a blacksmith?" And uh, so uh, that's where we'll start. And um, I don't know if I can fill forty-five minutes or uh, an hour with this, but uh, and that's probably why sixty minutes hasn't called me to do a TV show. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway. Uh, so, um, why blacksmith? Well, I, I ended up going to art school after uh, high school, um, basically because that's the only thing I was good at. I was uh, sort of a BC student. Uh, uh, that was before crayons. Uh, so, um, and um, so I ended up going to. Um, uh, art school, and that was because, uh, like I said, that was the only thing I was sort of uh, good at. And But I thought I was going to be uh, going to commercial art. And then, uh, while uh, our freshman year we had to take a certain amount of uh, uh, classes uh, in other things than what we wanted to major in. Uh, so. Um, and I was taking a, a, a metals course, uh, and um, with uh, Stanley Lexon, who was uh, a renowned uh, uh, metals goldsmith, actually, and jeweler. And um, so we were taking, a, you know, uh, some <coughs> basics. And uh, he was talking about there's goldsmiths and uh, and silversmiths and coppersmiths, and you know, and we were going to be raising vessels, and he said. And there's blacksmiths, but people really don't do that anymore. <laughs> Bing! You know, so I said, oh, I found my spot. So, uh, and, uh, so um, anyway, while that was going on, and um, uh, in the, there was an undercurrent of blacksmithing that was, that was stirring. After that freshman year, which I then was interested in doing metal work, uh, it sort of got something going that had started, I guess, in the seventh grade when we had to take a, a metals class. And while everyone is cutting out plastic uh, dogs and dachshunds and then polishing it, just plastic was the thing in the, you know, the, uh, I guess it would be the early 60s. Um, I said, I don't want to do this. I want I want to do something else, and I ended up raising a small bowl, and uh, and I think that the teacher sort of enjoyed that. I was, you know, challenging him as well, you know, because you know you could get everyone on the benches with files, you know, and here I was making noise, you know, and 
and keeping him uh, busy too. So anyway, so back to the art school. Um, so in my junior year, things sort of really sort of took off. Um, uh, we had to do a lot more uh, projects and um, I um, started making this bronze cross uh, and um, and I ended up um, selling it. Uh, where are we here? Let's uh, well, we'll go. Uh, let's go back a little bit. Uh, uh, this was a, a shop sign uh, um, at my last shop, and um, and then this next picture is. Uh, shop with my, uh, I call it my drunks uh, light, uh, and um, this was actually one piece of tubing that was left over from uh, uh, the um, Hershey Gardens where I had to make um, uh, Twizzlers, and um, I had one piece of this tubing left over, and so I made this drunks light. Uh, so instead of, you know, uh, it's just sort of the opposite of, you know, usually you have a drunk who's crooked against it. So this is just the opposite. So, uh, what's next? Oh, here we are at, uh, back at uh, uh, Tyler School of Art, which I, where I was in, in Philadelphia. Now one of the, we had a number of guest artists speak and um, two made a, a big impression on me, and uh, one was John Cage, who was very abstract, and the other one was um, uh, Frank uh, Stella. This is a sample of his work that he was doing in the uh, uh, 50s, uh, the 60s, and he came to speak uh, to us, and we were all excited, and. Um, he was there with his lawyer, and um, which after this lecture I probably wish I had mine also. So, <laughs> but yeah, people would ask him questions. He didn't really say anything, and uh, he then said, um, "Well, people would say like, how did you choose your colors?'" So then he would go over to his lawyer. I can't discuss that at this time. <laughs> so how did you decide on you know shapes? You know you you know on this. Uh, can't discuss that, that at this time, you know. So this went on, you know, and um, finally, um, um, I forget the guy's last name, but Peter, he was uh, in my class, he said, what do you think of the space program at this time? And he was, uh, the lawyer, I think it's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> had nothing to do with his work, and so he could discuss that. So I thought that was, uh, and then he just for the rest of the time showed different slides of his work, but didn't have to explain it or anything. And um, I thought that was sort of uh, great. Where are we here? I might be calling a tech. All right, this picture, um, is um, uh, Pat Lyons at the Forge by um, uh, John Neely. Uh, and um, when I was deciding to be a blacksmith, um, I was doing research and looking up pictures. This guy would always show up and um, finally I, I did some research and there was a copy or a, another uh, portrait, because the main one is in Boston, but this one is at the, uh, uh, the Academy of Art on Cherry Street down in Philadelphia. And the, the background of it, quickly, is uh, Pat Lyons um, uh, was a blacksmith and an inventor, but he also did the keys for um, Carpenter's Hall which, after he finished, uh, was robbed. And, and he was on vacation because there was some kind of 
fever going through Philadelphia, and he and his uh, family went to the country. And um, when he got back, he was arrested because they figured since he made the keys, he you know kept a duplicate, robbed it, and they couldn't find him. So, and he was put in jail. He was um, finally exonerated. He sued the city for something. Don't quote me on this. Where's my lawyer? Uh, uh, but it was something like forty thousand dollars, which was a lot of money back then. And he had the uh, money. Uh, then he had John Negley paint his portrait, and he had it painted not as um, as a business, you know, in a suit, but as a working class person, and that was sort of. Uh, the, you know, something that wasn't done. What this doesn't show over here, the, it's cropped, since this was basically on a Brookstone tool uh, catalog uh, that I took the picture and framed because I'm so cheap, you know, that, <laughs> that, that how did that happen? Or what do I do here? Did I get in front of something? and Just, just, no, it, what? Should be able to just click there and it should take you right back in. Wait, click where? Go ahead, John. Just yeah. We'll try. Are we still filming? Yeah. yeah. Under the spreading chestnut tree, the village smithy stands. The smith, the mighty man, is he with large and sinewy hands, and the muscles on his brawny arms are strong as iron bands. His hair is black and crisp and long, his face is like the tan. His brow is wet with earnest sweat, he earns whatever he can, and looks the whole world in the face, for he owes not any man. Week in, week out, from morn till night, you can hear his bellows blow. You can hear him swing his heavy sledge with measured beat and slow. Like the sexton ringing the evening bell when the evening sun is low. And the children coming home from school look in at the open door. They look to see the flaming forge and hear the bellows roar. And catch a burning spark that fly like chaff from a thrashing floor. On Sunday, he goes to the church and sits among the boys and hears the parson pray and preach, and hears his daughter's voice singing in the village choir. It sounds to him like her mother's voice, singing in paradise. Oh, his knees must think of her once more, and how engraved she lies, and with a hard rough hand wipes a tear out of his eye. Toiling, rejoicing, sorrowing, onward through life he goes. Each morning sees some task begin, each evening sees its close. Something attempted, something done, has earned his night's repose. Oh, thanks, thanks to thee, thy worthy friend, for the lesson thou hast taught. Thus by the flaming forge of life our fortunes must be wrought, and thus on the sounding anvil shaped each burning deed and thought. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's legendary poem that, um, that I thought was a great thing to try to to emulate that uh, that person, that uh, uh, though the uh, chestnut tree is gone, the smith uh, lives on, and um, though that the smithy stands, they always think of that as the person, but that's the the shop. The smithy is the shop. The smith would be the person, but the smithy is the forge. Uh, or the, the workplace. My wife is saying I'm square or yeah. You're, right not, you're, yeah, not, but, you're hey, not on the but, screen. Yeah, you're not I know, on the I'm screen. not on the screen, which is good <laughs> airplay. So unless so let's see. Uh, it looked extremely rocky for the Mudville Nine that day. The scores stood two to four with one inning left to play. Booty had struck out in the second. Barrows had done the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
she's on her way. Go ahead. So with, and, with, and with that, for, without your picture, pictures, yeah. uh, this the Smith that or the artist that got you started on this. Yeah, yeah. And never answered any of your questions. Why did that? Why was that so important to you? Oh, all right. Well, uh, I, I don't. You know, that is. Um, um, you know, the fact that he said not many people do it anymore. Well, in a way, he actually, um, Stanley was, um, Professor Lexton, was lying because um, what was happening at that time was blacksmithing in the art world was, take, was, was developing steam. In that, um, there was a number of things that happened in that, that year. Um, uh, Brett Kington, from a uh, professor, metals professor at the University of Southern Illinois, had a conference, and um, uh, what happened? Because I just reached over like this, and it went kapooey. <laughs> Let me get. Okay, there we are. We've left. Um, <laughs> And anyway, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll finish. Um, what was happening is um, Brett Kington was having a conference because he was interested in in blacksmithing on an artistic um, side, and he invited a number of people after the University of Southern Illinois. Um, and Stanley the, um, came back with tools and you know uh, and information and stuff, and. Um, and was doing a little bit of, of you know, of blacksmithing, and um, so that was that was going. In graduate school, there was a man by the name of Albert Paley, and um, he was doing uh, jewelry. He was in the uh, and um, Hershey is fortunate to have a piece of his artwork, um, which is called Passage at. Um, uh, at the hospital, and um, if you haven't seen it, I, you know, look for it. Look for it. Look for it, and if you've seen it, go visit it again. <laughs> you know, so, uh, and that's what I've done with this uh, picture by uh, Goya, and um, which is at the Frick uh, in New York. Now, when I was um, uh, at Tyler, I was also. Uh, a frustrated illustrator, uh, which I was glad I went more to uh, to the blacksmithing. But I was going into New York after I graduated from um, college to the New York School of Visual Arts. Uh, yeah, uh, and I was taking a course on humorous illustrating. But there was always lots of time, and the frick was free, and I would go visit it all the time. This painting is huge. It's like. Um, seven feet by six feet, you know, and you walk in, and this uh, piece of steel is, well, last time I did that, we got into under this <laughs> chestnut tree. But anyway, so it is so bright red, and this is Goya's um, black period, though this is very blue, again, because this was all a cheap reproduction that's in my house. Um, and, um, uh, there again, I didn't know if there was copyright, you know, saw this, so I figured if I got it off of, uh, you know, <laughs> off of a, a Brookstone tool catalog or something <laughs> like that, that, you know, uh, you're covered. Yeah. Where's my lawyer? You know? <laughs> so anyway, so uh, so that's it. So I, I, I visit that every time I, I go into the city. Um, in the uh, 70s, I was going in regularly, like I said, to, I was taking a course. Uh, at the New York School of Visual Arts, and I was also trying to peddle my drawings to the New Yorker, and um, so um, and so I'd always go in and visit um, this painting, and, uh, which was was nice. Uh, um, if you remember, I said I was doing a, a bronze uh, cross. I was getting into forging, um, and um, I ended up selling it. Now, with the help of my mother, 
Um, I, my dad um, was a, a Presbyterian minister in Westfield, New Jersey, and I guess my mom was talking at the AMP with uh, another, uh, a, this was a Baptist minister's wife, and uh, said that we're looking for some kind of a memorial or something. Bing, my mother said, you know, I've got a son, you know. <laughs> was like, you know. So it all worked. Well, they didn't know if they were going to spend the money on this or a drinking fountain uh, that they were making. So, uh, but it did. And um, you can see as we're grabbing toward the top, and whoever gets to the top first actually gets to wear my hair. So, uh, so, so, <laughs> so anyway, so that was, that was it. And um, I don't know if it's still there, but I know a week after I delivered it, uh, I got a call and I had to repair it because they had leaned it on the side and something had broken off and I had to, and I said, didn't you hang it? And they said, no, we had it. Right. You had it on the side? Yeah. I, I told you not to put it. <laughs> so. You said that's bronze? Bronze, yeah. Oh, okay. Which is interesting. The sermon today was on Cain and Abel. Cain, if you go a little bit further in the story, Descendants, Tubal Cain, worker of bronze and iron tools. <laughs> That's a little added thing, you know, to Stephen's uh, thing. So, and that was another thing I was doing research, you know, looking like, do I want to become a blacksmith? I'd go to the Bible, you know, and I'd say, what does the Bible say about smithing? Well, the first, you know, isn't that good, you know? I mean, your ancestors are sort of with this Cain family, but actually they're all responsible for civilization pretty much, you know, and building and blah, blah, blah. So, and then you go a little bit further, and uh, if you get into kinks, there's no smith in the land. That's, again, I wanted to get those smiths out there again, you know? So, uh, uh, and then there's great other um, pieces of iron mentioned in the Bible. Um, just as iron sharpens iron, so does man, one man's wit sharpen another. Now, I'm getting my feet into good soil, and so I'm moving forward into this. So, I'm selling my blacksmith, uh, my silversmithing tools for blacksmithing tools. I'm traveling. I didn't have a car, so I was always bugging my roommate who had a car uh, to take me different places. One of the places we went was Gilbert's, um, Gilbertsville, where you could get, they had, uh, it was outside of Reading, I believe, where they could get all sorts of neat stuff, um, hopefully some tools, I picked up some, but you could also see the Mighty Adam. Mighty Adam also was known as Joseph Greenberg, who was a strong man, and, um, sold soap and, um, and a laxative. His laxative contained every herb that's in the Bible. And he said, if you take this, don't immediately go into the bathroom. You go to bed and you'll be awakened by the telegram, but you won't have to open it because you'll know where to go. <laughs> I think at the time I might have been in an altered state of awareness and was eating Bing cherries. And I can remember Joseph Greenberg, also known as the Mighty Adam, saying, Are you a hippie? <laughs> My mouth dropped. My friends, where's your lawyer? <laughs> so anyway. So, um, but yeah, we found tools everywhere. And Mighty Adam, he was that man with the strong and I... Uh, as Iron Bands, a great uh, person who we visited several times uh, to fill me in and how to be uh, uh, a good man. Um, where are we here? Yep. Oh, this is a piece that I made um, here. So I guess we'll talk about you know some pieces that are uh, in the church. Uh, this was one um, Christmas early on. That really is nice. So, uh, <laughs> hadn't seen it in a while. Um, people always wondered what these things, <laughs> is that a turtle coming? I, nah, I don't know. So, but anyway, yeah, that, uh, 
in the lounge. I it's still called the lounge. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> what are we getting here? This is a piece that uh, uh, that I made here at, at the church. I made a lot of pieces after um, Chuck Alexander, did, you know, made the thing, and there was just a lot of places that I thought needed, you know, some some focus, and I took it on myself to do this. But, and I think Dick Houts, a lot of people really like this piece, yeah, like and um, like uh, and this was was one of the first pieces I did. That of a, an actual figure, and um, sort of rising up from the the chains of. Uh, uh, oh, here's uh, Albert Paley's um, piece um, uh, passage. That, uh, that was uh, when um, they did the dedication um, for that. Um, I was invited, and um, by someone who was in the church. I can't. They've since left. I can't remember. Because it was funny, when they were putting it up, I said, that's got to be an Albert Paley. So I was calling people, and, they, and no one would know. And finally, you know, um, I thought of um, the Russells. I thought he was with the, with the, um, uh, the hospital. And um, he said, no, but here, here's another you know, name, to, you know, and I called this person left a message, I said, well, what's the story on this sculpture? It's got to be an Albert Paley or someone who's ripping them off, you know, because it was going up. And um, my wife was the one that alerted me about it, you know, you should see this, there's some kind of big sculpture going up. Went over there. So anyway, um, uh, it was hit, and I was saying like, oh my gosh, we're getting an Albert Paley, you know, and everyone's like, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so, uh, I've got to straighten this. That's one of my phobias. <laughs> uh, uh, um, you know, this guy, uh, H.B. All, who did this, um, was from Westfield uh, originally, worked with the, uh, the New York Herald as an illustrator uh, on their horticultural thing. And my dad um, said, if you come to Hershey, try to look this guy up. Anyway. Uh, sideline. And so, anyway, uh, uh, Paley um, uh, is putting up this thing, and um, so I ended up getting invited to the, um, to the dedication. And um, the, the dedication were those who gave, like, you know, a couple thousand dollars, and I can remember going in and a couple people, you know, saying, what are you doing? <laughs> and luckily I could say I know the artist <laughs> which was great you know uh, which, so anyway so um, Albert Paley getting back to, to her, um, Tyler and I know this is all convoluted because uh, I don't have a lawyer uh, <laughs> is that he was doing stuff and people would say you've got to see Albert's stuff you know he's starting to do iron work you know and um, our paths didn't cross well in, in college. Um, and like I said, I was uh, collecting tools. Now, doing that, that forged bronze uh, cross got me not in good relationships with people who are doing fine jewelry. When you're doing fine jewelry and setting stones, you don't want to have a lot of noise going on. You know? And I was making a lot of noise. So they also said, to Stan and the other uh, professor, can you get this guy <laughs> out of here? So they moved me over to the sculpture studio, which was sort of rough because the only way I could quench the bronze was in the urinals. <laughs> now, luckily, they, the old urinals were those long ones that went all the way to the floor, not these small ones, you know, where they're splatter, you know. I could stick a lot of these pieces right in there, flush it, and cool it. So, so that was, you know. So I never told the Baptists this story. Though so it would fit in with their you know, theology, you know. So anyway. Uh, where were we after that? Uh, um, 
so Al, I never really ran into you know him um, there. Oh, oh, what really got me kicked out of the metals department was um, I'd gotten a deal on these cast iron tools, but they had to be hardened. So um, there was like this big unit with an exhaust fan so crowded because people doing metals work and they had to then heat up their piece, cool it, and then, you know. So I took two asbestos plates and went over with a acetylene torch and on one of these desks, heated up my pieces till they got a dull red and then put it into oil. Well, the smoke was one thing. And the second was, and I didn't realize it till the next day when I came in, when they took off the two asbestos pads and realized that the heat had burned a charcoal section on the top of the uh, section. So, yeah, I don't know what happened here. So, um, so anyway, so um, they said, um, didn't you know what was heating it? I said, well, there was so much smoke from the, this, I couldn't separate the, the wood smoke from the oil smoke, you know. So I was pretty much banned from the studio and stayed most of my time in the sculpture uh, studio. So that's when I sort of switched to sculpture uh, instead of metals. It also gave you a lot more freedom, you know. Uh, it just opened up uh, the, the scope a little bit more. Um, what was I, uh, there was something else I was going to, oh. They also said, um, um, why did you, I said, you know, I don't think I had enough, you know, uh, supervision. <laughs> so that was, uh, so I got away with that and didn't have to. But I was already in trouble because I was on a work study program while this is going on. I'll give you this sideline. That in a work study, you, had, you know, had to do a certain amount of help, you know, at the college. Well, they put me in the office. I'm not an office person. And I'm not a good typist, you know, hit, hit and peck, you know, point, point, point. So people would say, you know, uh, would write in, uh, we're interested in Tyler, do you have a photography part? Can you, think, think, we do not, you cannot major in photography, think, think, you know, think. or do you have a glass department? Think, 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 we don't have a glass department. Well, that was fine, but I also, in my evil mind at that time, that I have stationery, official stationery. How can I use this for nefarious reasons? So I, so I, I then sent letters that I that they had. Certain of my friends had to report to the dean's office, and uh, and since it was on an official stationery, it was official. So why you know ten people would de would descend on. Uh, Dean LeClaire's office, you know, uh, and it was easy because of the typing errors, you know, to realize who did this. I was sent to the kitchen then and spent the rest of the time washing dishes uh, uh, for my work study program. I don't know what she did, but uh, you know. it apparently times out. Yeah, that's what it's acting like. Do I, did I hit something no, or what? No. Uh, it she turned it off and on, Charlie. Oh, oh. Yeah, she, she turned it on and off. Right? Oh. 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 And I'm so I, sorry. I, that's all right. I, you know, I have got one more poem I can recite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it looks good here. And they said that so. I'm taking too long. <laughs> Where's my lawyer? That's what I do. <laughs> right behind you. <laughs> That's my tech help. Here, I got two tech people. <laughs> tech one, tech two. There you go. There it is. Right. We're learning for next time. You definitely are guinea pigs. So thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's get figure that out, Charlie. Charlie no. you watch? Yeah. It's part yeah. Of the I was watching. Oh, we're going the wrong way. Oh, All right. Oh, All right, here. Okay, let's let's move to this piece. This was done in I think '96, and 
if you believe in spirituality, my mother had died in 96, which was also the year that the Wall Street Bridge, Walnut Street Bridge in Harrisburg collapsed. Because we had gone um, to visit her, and since my family lives really long, um, uh, we visited them for her birthday and gave her some, uh, a gift. And, um, blah, 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 blah. Anyway. She had, um, in 96, I did this toward the Lent, right before Lent was starting, and um, really driven, and the other thing that happened was, this man, George Siegel, if you, if, are you familiar with his work at all, George Siegel, he does, um, would put, um, make plaster casts of people uh, and then um, cast their body in, in using the, the uh, medical um, cloth that's dipped in plaster and cast these um, different scenes. Um, if you're ever in Princeton, he has one that's in bronze uh, of Abraham, uh, Abraham and Isaac. And instead of having uh, being a young child, Isaac is actually a young man like in his 20s, he's on his knees, and um, Abraham has a knife right down, like he's just going to, you know, right in the gut, you know. It's really moving. What's interesting, and why it's at Princeton, because it, in 1970, if you remember, you know, the, the, this whole 60s thing is, you know, racial problems, the war, you know, going on. Blacksmiths are turning, you know, they're not singing in unison yet, but, you know, they're things are happening. But anyway, uh, Kent State asked um, George Siegel if they would, if he would make something for their yard, you know, for this, uh, because of the killings that happened in, in the 70s. This is uh, later in the 90s. He delivers this Abraham and Isaacs thing, you know, and the trustees go, oh, that's too, you know, uh, you know, that ain't going to happen. You know, older people killing younger people, you know. Yeah, that's not going to work. So it sat in the storeroom. Finally, uh, someone at Princeton says, uh, hey, hey, we'll take that. And it's in front of the chapel, uh, and it's, it's, it's great. So anyway, back to this piece. Why I, I did this, I have no idea. But... <laughs> Here's a, here's a little piece of trivia in here. In here, there's a, um, uh, I scratched in here is a tic-tac-toe uh, piece. <laughs> Why is that? Well, in the Bible, there's two terms, and it's also on the seal of Yale. Um, Urim and Thorum. They're always seen together. They're when you cast lots. Um, you throw these dice or stones, and they're called Urim and Thorim. They're always seen together in the Bible. They don't know much about it, um, uh, historians, but biblical things. But I thought, I'm not going to have, I didn't know how to do that. But so a tic-tac-toe was the easiest way to get that concept, you know, of chance, Unless you're really good at tic-tac-toe. Someone's <laughs> always going to win, you know. So whoever goes first, I think, you know. But anyway, in talking about this just the other day, uh, a week or so, month, where's my lawyer? Uh, um, Pam um, Whiteneck was asking me, can you remember who, who were the hands in here? I couldn't remember, but, um, but one person I didn't remember and it was Joe Haddad, a friend of mine, and he's in, in there. So someone gets scraped, you know, and because I think I had the 13 in here. So anyway, so uh, it was just a real fun thing to do. Uh, the idea came up, and um, it just everything just seemed to fall into place. Uh, we were doing the Lenten breakfast. It was one of the first years we did it. I said, you know, hey, after, you know, when you're done, if anyone wants to come into the kitchen, you know, and do these, we're going to cast these hands, it's only going to take a few minutes. I had the Vaseline, I had stuff to clean off the Vaseline, blah, blah, blah. And then we, we put it together, and um, 
it just uh, it, it just really turned out great I thought yeah. and uh, so we put it in where to put it a lot of people didn't like where we put it uh, but I stuck it up there you gotta look up you know a lot of people don't look up which is people if you learn anything look up you know <laughs> uh, look at trees look at you know just looking up just is is uh, is great um, uh, yeah, so all right I'll talk any longer on that but anyway let's uh, this um, was one of the first pieces I did using um, making figures again you know and um, this was also used um, uh, a type it was a type of steel but it's called um, true iron and one of the things that was happening after World War II um, they weren't making wrought iron anymore they were making steel they were making a low-grade uh, steel which was now called mild steel but wrought iron has a lot of different properties. This doesn't have the same properties as wrought iron, but it's more workable underneath the hammer. And getting back to you, Bill, and saying why I like this, there was something about the directness. Uh, blacksmithing, I always say, is the rock and roll of crafts because you have fire, you have heat, you have noise, and it's right there. It's not like ceramics where it's boom, 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 and then there's fire. It's bang, bang. It's like all this all at once, and things are happening under your force right there, and and, and it's it's exciting. I just always thought it was exciting, and you know I like so anyway. This um, I made this, and um, uh, I think it was then given to um, uh, Brad Wilson uh, uh, when he uh, left um, uh, the Senate. How big is that piece? Uh, like this. Oh, okay. Can you make that? What, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> that was sort of how, you know, Told me. that was another thing I liked about blacksmithing. For me at that point, it wasn't, you know, um, you had to have it, you know, you have to cut it exactly 12 inches, <laughs> like in woodworking, you know. You know, for me at that time, and that was another thing that was happening, one of the big skills in blacksmithing was um, uh, is forge welding, is heating it up, getting it, and that takes a, a lot of practice. So in joining something that metalsmiths, copper, silver, gold, already knew how to do was rivet. We could drill a hole or punch a hole, put a rivet in there and squeeze it, or collar it, put a piece of steel around two pieces and wrap it. So it became uh, sort of a lot of stuff was sort of what they called spaghetti iron because they would draw out pieces and then wrap it around uh, over and over. So, where are we here? Uh, here. This piece um, I had done and put it here again. This almost goes back to who's the third um, person of, of uh, Adam and Eve? The third son. Seth. Clocks. I was thinking, you know, Seth Thomas. But it was time for a change. That's what this time element is always something that is occurring in the Bible. And, um, and of course, this is right out and going down the stairs, which you can see as you're walking up the hallway, which I thought was a great place for it. Um, when I left um, Derry and we moved up to Landisburg, um, uh, I had forgotten, I had done a cross, and this isn't a good picture, unfortunately. Um, I was asked um, by uh, Susie Boss, uh, they had, Second Presbyterian had uh, just put in a new um, a chapel, and they wanted, uh, and Susie thought, oh, I could get a cross for there. And um, so I came up with this. There was restrictions price-wise, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, but this is what I came up. I had two designs. She chose this. And it was sort of, you know, wheat, sea, you know, sun, you know, blah, you know, so it tied in those elements. My biggest mistake was that I didn't visit the site because it's an all-brick 
and it's very dark. And so this sort of got lost in it. And um, but so when I got to the church, um, I didn't. I forgot all about this. It was when I was doing something for something else, unpacking boxes, and I'm looking at this one thing. Uh, oh, I did a cross for Second Presbyterian, and I, <laughs> and I and I so I'm trying to find even a picture which I did. So I told him, and I went back and I said, "Listen, if I'm going to join this church, the cross has to come out of I don't know where it is. Storage it was anyway." So. Um, why can't I remember that? Um, pattern welded steel. Um, this is when uh, you mix different grades of steel. You might have a wrought iron, you might have a mild steel or a high carbon steel, and the real bright stuff is, is uh, pure nickel. So if you get that under the right circumstances, you can hammer that and fuse that together. And if you twist it, you can make different designs and stuff. Um, this was a simple high-low, and you have and these three pieces were actually done by Robert Eggerling, who who um, is in um, Kutztown, PA, and has a fabulous business in just making bl you know blanks of uh, pattern welded steel. This was done during a demonstration uh, of my just grabbing stuff, you know, in the guy's shop and putting it together. Um, Going back to after um, after I graduated from um, uh, Tyler, um, one of my uh, roommates and friend Robert uh, Griffith, he went on to the University of Southern Illinois, which Brett Kingdom uh, was saying. He also met up with a guy by the name of Daryl Meyer, and another guy by the name of um, Jim Wallace. Jim Wallace later became the curator uh, of um, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, of the National Iron Museum, and um, Daryl Meyer really excelled in making Damascus um, steel. And then during the Bush administration, he made a Bowie knife with the American flag with 50 stars, uh, and each star was I, I should have gotten a picture, but it was pretty amazing, and. Um, and then also in the white area, it said "Made in America." I mean, it was just a, you know. And that all is I, the Damascus pattern. All in Damascus. So if you would have cut that piece of steel oh. anyway, it would come up there. It all becomes. And you then put a light acid <clears throat> etch on it, and then the colors come up. Yeah. But it was it just amazing. I remember someone asked me. Um, he was at a, a, a one of the blacksmithing gatherings. He said, "Do you know?" what to do if you know how to make this and he said, yeah the first thing I do is ask Daryl <laughs> for help so uh, um, this stuff is sort of out of whack uh, this was a cross I made for um, th this was actually came back and I wish I had polished up the uh, the cross part but made for um, Chris Howe um, no Casey for Casey, Casey. and um, I he was becoming a Methodist mission, uh, um, minister, and I wanted this. What, what bring? What's the connection between all members? And that's that our unity in Christ. You know that we be all believe in Christ. That was the concept behind the mail. This mail, if I would have charged what it took me to, to make this, would you know? He just was it. Nah, you know. <laughs> We'll go to Woolworths, you know. So it, it just was so these little eighth-inch uh, little things of stainless, you know, opening it and getting it, and oh, it was just frustrating. My wife will even admit, you know, uh, that it was it, it was tedious. So anyway, and that uh, so anyway, I I I just I mean I just sort of liked it. So, uh, I always push the wrong button. Oh, oh. no, no, no. Again. Okay, here. Oh, that's me. No, that's not right. <laughs> Let me try again. There is more It seems like it's this. It's not this. It's the screen. <laughs>
the way this next picture is going to be um, of um, the one I made for Chris, who uh, was a Presbyterian minister. And this was really influenced by when my dad had passed, my dad kept all sorts of things that on tape. He was blind and um, uh, was always interested in recording on tape. So, Well, I found a tape that the senior minister in Westfield had, um, Westfield, New Jersey, had made uh, uh, back in uh, 1966. And it was basically, um, it was a Thanksgiving uh, uh, sermon, and it was basically the balance between uh, politics and religion, which was that, so uh, it really uh, got to me in that, so I thought of this um, uh, plumb bob, you know, which ties into the fact of Christ being a carpenter, that whole concept. And if also you read about Amos, uh, Amos says uh, God put a, uh, a plumb bob down, so that's the vertical. So uh, so you have a vertical and horizontal thing making the cross. And then um, this is sort of like an Egyptian you know, type of thing, but also uh, using Damascus, three different pieces, three different kinds of steel, Trinity, but it's fused together, like um, like the Trinity. I thought, you know, that concept, you know, and then uh, you know, well, I, I mean, I just thought it was. So is that about three inches? Uh, yeah, it's about like this. It's a pectoral cross. Oh. Uh, this piece, of course, uh, if you remember, was um, uh, made for Dick House when he uh, when he left, and. This came out, I used a primitive style uh, for this, uh, almost like uh, what they call also, uh, I can't think of the, the right term, but it's sort of like uneducated uh, people who do art. <laughs> Where's my lawyer? <laughs> so anyway, uh, um, but uh, Dick uh, in his uh, Easter thing had this whole like um, big circle, I forget what, the, what he did, you know, uh, the vigil, that uh, big vigil, and that usually discussed the different parts of the Bible and went through in that time. So this started with Adam and Eve, and then you had uh, Noah's Ark, uh, and then uh, the dove coming down, and that dove then again mimicked in, in the the church, the uh, the cross that was uh, the last thing uh, Abraham and Isaac, and then. Um, and Zachariah, the dry bones, and then of course rising up, and then uh, Christ. Uh, oh, I just it was fun to do, and um, and I thought I really got the earth looking really cool. Uh, here's a recent piece I did of um, some turtles for uh, uh, a sculpture uh, I did. That's about like this. Okay, now, since I, when I had, since I, you know, I'm not tech savvy. I, I've proven that. I don't need a lawyer for this. Um, that, you know, I had someone help me, and I didn't want to use too much time because, you know, I don't think they were real happy, you know. Anyway, but anyway, Samuel Yellen, when I did that, uh, that cross, that bronze cross, um, I... I had to do some research about forging and stuff like that, and so I said, well, let's see if there's anyone in the phone book, Philadelphia phone book. Here enough, Samuel Yellen had the smallest listing, gave, I didn't even call, there's no cell phones back then, remember, and I go down, and I go to this guy's shop, and it's a little like a little Judas window, I ring the buzz, it's electric, but <laughs> nothing happens, finally the window opens, I'm here to see Samuel Yellen, he's dead. So he closes the, you know, and I start walking away, and the door opens. He says, where the F are you going? You know, and I, and I he said, well, you, I, he's dead, I, you know. And uh, so he says, I'm Harvey Yellen, I'm his nephew, um, what do you want? And I said, well, I told him, blah, 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 Tyler, blah, blah. come on in. 
So he shows me this stuff that is in Yellen's museum. This is just a book uh, that Jack Andrews, who was at, is at uh, another art school in Philadelphia, had put. And I turned him on to iron at Hershey Park, and I made a spoon out of just like a little piece of nothing. And uh, he bought it, and that got him, and he wrote some books and stuff like that. Anyway, so anyway, this shows some of the, the intricate, uh, a lot of the gates to Yale and Harvard, all made by Yellen. Uh, it was just, he was just an amazing um, uh, blacksmith. Uh, and, um, and a lot of people have uh, tried to emulate his, his work, and uh, he became like really a high, high mark to try to meet his skill. Uh, just a, a, another, then, so I, 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 went, I went to his shop, I came back and I was super happy, and, it, and then Stanley says, well, we're gonna go visit that shop in two weeks, why did you go there? <laughs> You know, well, I'm over in this. He sent me over to the sculpture studio. I'm not, you know, I didn't hear all the the news. So anyway, uh, I got to turn this. Came out after my, um, my senior year was the Art of Blacksmithing by Alex B. Bieler, which happened in in either 1971. There was a gathering of smiths in Lumpkin, Georgia. And um, a lot of people met, and what ended up happening in Lumpkin, Georgia, was the start of the Artist Blacksmith Association of North America. And um, B uh, Beeler was there, uh, pumping his book. At that time, this was basically the only book out there, you know, on how to do blacksmithing. And this guy was a commercial artist, got into uh, blacksmithing, and um, put this book up. Um, I met him years later um, down in uh, South Carolina, I can't remember, for a blacksmithing uh, gathering that Abana artists, uh, blacksmiths, North America, blah, 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 I put together. And I met him, and I remember around the campfire, he started talking, and he was just a great storyteller, and I can just remember uh, him talking about going into a blacksmith shop and listen to the whoosh of the bellows, you know, and his southern accent. Uh, but the book um, became like the Bible for so many um, young blacksmiths. Now, there's so many books out 50 years later uh, because of, you know, people just being, and TV shows, uh, fire and whatever, you know, where they're making knives and everything. That was the other thing. <laughs> now, I didn't really want to um, make weapons. I always wanted to make something other than weapons or knives and stuff like that. And that's, you know, you could make more money making knives. But uh, um, I'm always pushing the wrong button. I'll push it again. Mark, you have about two minutes before the recording cuts, up, cuts off. Oh, okay. All right. You can keep going. But oh, all right. Okay. This book was another book that came out later uh, in the 70s. And... Though it, it's just pictures, it's a, a museum that's in Rouen, France. Everyone got it. It was because people were starting to, you know, interested in, in ironwork. And um, what was funny is um, a lot of people started making these things as pot racks. But when we, I went to the museum in the '80s, they were like only this big around. They were to hang game. They were called Dutch crowns, yeah. and you would hang game from it. But not having any measurements on the pictures or anything like that, so many people didn't know what the heck you know size it was. So we were thinking, you know, so we're making pot racks. People are making pot racks using this design, and so and there's another thing that there's these little miniatures that look like huge gates, but when we finally saw them, they were just only like this big. So that was another book that came out later that influenced a lot of people. And to make money was this Soane's book, which great drawings uh, of early American wrought iron, which um, a lot of people going into iron at that time were making early colonial pieces because that's how you could make money. Uh, though there was some people that were doing some more art things, 
they weren't eating as well. So, uh, <laughs> but they actually ate better on the long run. But uh, so anyway, um, this book became uh, a, another book that came out uh, later. More books have come out, but this was a you know a book that was a reprint that put um, Soane's um, work together. Great uh, charcoal drawings uh, or graphite drawings in it. And um, as you can see, it was well used in my house. And um, uh, so, uh, oh, there's some of the the, uh, the illustrations which were very helpful. Um, this this book came out, um, I believe, in the 90s, and um, uh, 